Well, we find ourselves in an interesting situation here in the United States and other parts of the world where uh, there are no public sacraments, there are no public masses. And so many people are asking the question, well, how do we, be, how do we act and live as Catholics? And I'm here today with the great, wise, and prudent Eric Sammons, father and husband, theologian. And we're going to discuss not just surviving and making it work, but in a way becoming a leader and using this as a time to do real evangelization, to bring people to Jesus Christ and to live in a way a sacramental life, even though we don't have the actual outward sacraments or most of us. Uh, at least in our situation, don't. So, Eric Sammons, welcome aboard. Thanks for having me, Taylor. Yeah, this should be a fun show. Yeah, let's hope so. We're going to talk um, a lot from the father's perspective and what we can do to have confidence and to lead as fathers. But I think most of everything we discuss today will apply to everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, well, we'll begin with our prayer, and then we'll roll right into it. I invite everyone to pray the Our Father, the Pater Noster, in Latin. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater Noster, qui est in Celi, sanctificator nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra. Panem nostrum quotidianum da nobis odie, temite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, Sed libera nos amalo. Amen. Amen. Nomine Patris et Fidei et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, I did a, a video on Tuesday, and that was how to be a Catholic in this time of crisis. I think it was called Being Catholic Under Quarantine. And uh, I talked about how to use the missile, how to perform what's called a dry mass using the missile. Uh, obviously not a holy sacrifice of the Mass, but using the, the propers and certain parts of the ordinary. We talked about how to do emergency baptisms, conditional baptisms. We talked about what to do if you've committed a mortal sin and need to go to confession. We talked about imperfect and perfect acts of contrition. We talked about extreme unction and even matrimony when there are no priests. So we covered all that in the previous video. Today, it's going to be a bit more practical sort of boots on the ground, how do we become leaders, evangelizers, people who are actively living the gospel and bringing other people to the gospel in a time when you can't just say, hey, drive up to church with me. So how do we do that, Eric? I'm going to drink. Well, I think, I think the first thing we do is something I heard a number of years ago, something Scott Hahn said really struck me. And this was when I was a young father. I think I had one or two kids at the time, very young. And he said that fathers in particular, but parents in general, they need to exercise non-anxious leadership. And this idea of non-anxious leadership really stuck with me because I have a tendency myself personally to be somewhat of a control freak. And I want everything in its place. I want my kids in the pro doing exactly what I want them to do. I want everything to be perfectly aligned. I want to be able to go to mass on Sunday. I want to be able to receive the sacraments when I want to receive them. And so what can happen is, is that we can develop a lot of anxiety in normal life towards, for example, will my kids stay faithful? Will my kids uh, be Catholics when they grow up? All these things. Will they marry a good Catholic man or a good Catholic woman? All these things can give us anxiety. And in general, in normal life, we are to exercise leadership in a non-anxious way because we know God is ultimately in control. But I think in a time like now, when we're in this crisis that we're in, where we don't have access, to, uh, public access to the sacraments, particularly the Holy Mass, I think it's especially a time that we have to exercise that non-anxious leadership. What I mean by that is we shouldn't be spending all our time worrying about what's going to come next. Will our government shut down the ability to go out at all? Will our uh, church leaders ever bring back the public mass? Will I hear this is going to happen? I hear that is going to happen. I think what, ha what that does, it just builds up anxiety and it doesn't allow us to really live our faith as Catholics. When you look at how the saints have lived in times of persecution, in times in which they didn't have access to the sacraments, what I've always been struck by is their calm, that they are very calm in these situations because they know 
in divine, the divine providence is always with them, that God is always with them and leading them. And he's always giving them the graces they need for salvation. Right. Obviously, as Catholics, we believe it's the sacraments is the, the primary means in which we receive grace from God. And that is fundamental teaching of the church. At the same time, we also believe that God never leaves us orphans, and therefore we always will be able to receive the graces we need. Uh, Bishop Schneider, Athanasius Schneider, he, he was born in an era where they didn't have access to the sacraments. They might not see a priest for years at a time. Yet his mother, particularly, and his father, but his mother, he says, was just such a saintly and holy woman. Yeah. And she lived the faith, and she was a leader, and she was an example for him even in spite of the fact that she had no access to the sacraments because God supplied the graces she needed. And so I think that would probably be the number one thing is let's not be so caught up in worrying and complaining. You know, I know a lot of us, a lot of people did not, Catholics did not agree with the, the quick decisions of the bishops to shut down public celebration of mass. I get that. And many Catholics did agree with it. The, the debate is somewhat irrelevant at this point because it's happened. Right. And so comp continuing to complain about it, continuing to agonize over it, I don't think helps us. What I think we do now is we move forward and we say, okay, now in this situation God has put us in, God has allowed us to be in, what do we do to be faithful Catholics to lead others to the faith as well? Yeah, yeah. I, I want to mention that too. It, there's a lot of uh, cutting and slashing on Twitter and social media over uh, the Sunday Mass. And I think we need to accept whether you agree with it or disagree with it. I tend to disagree with how fast they rolled it out and without any other provisional elements. So my disagreement is one on prudence. Whether you agree or disagree, we need to realize that most Catholics don't believe in the real presence, don't believe in transubstantiation. Most Catholics are, I'm talking about America, pro-abortion, pro-contraception. And we need to realize that it's not necessarily the the vice of the bishops. It's a merciful and caring God who's saying, you're now being disciplined. You're being disciplined, right? And we just need to accept that. I feel like in a way, it's God's interdict. Yes. Back in the Middle Ages, yes. the, the popes would place entire countries under interdict. I remember uh, England, I think, had it for six years or something like that, many a long period of time. where the And so they had no access to the sacraments. And that was done as a punishment. And whether or not every time the pope did it was a good idea, prudence and yeah. all that is another story. But, but it was done to basically splash cold water on the face of Catholics and say, what you're, the path you are going on right now right. is not good. And I would say, in a sense, this is, in God's permissive will, he is allowing us to be put under interdict yeah. because of the fact that we have, as Catholics, as a Catholic church, we have allowed uh, abortion on demand. We have allowed the acceptance of, uh, of homosexuality and other uh, sins of the flesh. We have allowed so pornography is just rampant uh, among our people. And I think all of those things, frankly, any one of them are deserving of this. Yeah. And so even if we disagree with how the bishops went about this, the fact is, is that it can be used as a wake up call to say, this is a time that we really should come together to repent of our sins yeah. for the things we have not done and to open our eyes to say, you know, we have not been We've not been doing it right <laughs> for a very long time, and we need to turn around. Repent. I mean, it's, it's like when Jonah went to Nineveh, what did they do? When they repented, they called the 40-day the fast ash, uh, sackcloth and ashes, and that was to say we are turning away. And I think, that's, I think that's a message God is telling us today and in a very startling way. And I think that's a loving thing to do, frankly, and because— Sometimes it takes a very shock. It takes a shock to the system right. to change your life. You, when you grow comfortable, you just keep doing the same things you're doing. And if there's one thing the Catholic Church in America has been, it's been comfortable. Oh, yeah. We've been comfortable for very long, and that's why we can't change. And perhaps this will be a way, and we we get out of that comfort. Yeah. 
And there's a lot of voices as well, even in the Catholic hierarchy, who are saying God doesn't will plagues, God doesn't will punishments and all that. But I think what they're missing, because they haven't read the Bible, everyone should read the Bible. We've talked about, we've been talking about that more and more. We need a biblical worldview to understand these things. In the Bible, punishments, disciplines are always just that, disciplines. They're therapeutic. The reason God punishes ancient Israel with plagues and invasions and crop failure and all that is always to turn their heart back to him. That's Remember, the point. God, yeah. God can do anything, which means he could have prevented the virus from spreading from even existing. Yes. And so if he allowed it to exist... I think the biblical way of looking at it is to say, why? Yes. Why did he allow this to happen? And like you said, when you look, especially at the Old Testament, and even if you look at the church fathers and in medieval times, they always saw these things as a sign of divine displeasure. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know how you can't look at how we have been living and not think God is displeased with us. And yes, God does get displeased. He gets angry. And to think he doesn't is a, it's not a, a proper view of God. God gets angry at times. And his anger, though, is, is like a father who gets angry with his children at times. There's nothing wrong with anger if it's properly directed. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of it is to bring about a change in behavior with somebody. And so saying God is angry with us does not mean that he has left us orphans or that he rejects us. What it's saying is that, his anger has arisen because he wants us to turn to him because he knows what's best for us. He knows what we're doing now is leading many souls to hell, and he wants that to stop. And so sometimes he might allow something like this. And I don't think that – I think it's a very biblical way of looking at it, uh, and I, I think that's the way we should look at it, frankly. And what you're saying, Eric, doesn't just apply to nations and the planet. It applies to your personal life. God may allow those cancer cells in your body – to reduplicate at a crazy rate so that you have a malignant tumor. Right. God can stop it. Sometimes he allows it because he says, you know what? I want this person to turn to me to repent and make a great act of faith, hope, and charity and repentance and maybe skip purgatory. How awesome would that be? If right. That's the outcome. Right. And so I think what that's, I think that's the number one thing we do here is, we we accept God's the fact that God is dis, is displeased with us. We accept that the punishment He gives us, whether it's through His permissive will or His active will, we accept that these things are a reality. We accept the fact that our bishops have decided not to allow the public celebration of Mass, and then we say, "Okay, God, you're telling me something. Now, how do I respond?" And so now we, we, we go towards responding to it. And another thing I wanted to mention that I've seen a few people saying, and I, I think is a bad way to look at it, don't try to minimize the, the situation we're in, in the sense of, like I've seen some people say, well, mass is still being celebrated. Yes, that's true. And that's important yes. that mass is still being celebrated. At the same time, it's a big deal that we can't go. Lay people, you and me yeah. and, and other lay people can't go. It's, it, when I say it's a big deal, I mean it's a huge deal. Now, you could say, well, the, the, the early church Christians had it rougher. The, the, the English Catholics in, in post-Reformation times had it tougher. Soviet, yes, that may or may not be true. But the fact is, is that we are living today. We are 2020 Catholics we have never faced anything like this before. None of us uh, Americans have ever faced anything like this before. And so we don't want to say it's not that big a deal. It is a big deal. What we want to do, though, is say, okay, it's a big deal. Now, how do I respond to it? How do I unite my sufferings with the sufferings of Christ to make them redemptive? Yeah. And I think that's really what we do now is we move forward and say, now we want to embrace this suffering even, not just endure it, but embrace it. Light, there's a, I, I'm looking at it right now, I can't grab it, I'm looking at it right now, there's a stat, I have this uh, statue of St. Francis of Assisi embracing Jesus on the cross, mm -hmm. and it's one of my favorite statues because it really shows the life of St. Francis that he did not run from the cross, he, he embraced it. And of course we see that God showed how much he, how much Francis embraced by giving him the stigmata. Mm -hmm. 
And I think that's what we're supposed to do now is we embrace the suffering at united to Christ always as a chance for redemption. Because I think it can be something that brings us to salvation, but also can bring others to salvation through evangelization, through different things we can do now. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to what you said, Eric, there about what was it? Non-anxious leadership. Was that the phrase? Yes. Yes. Non-anxious leadership. Non-anxious leadership. This is, um, you know, what people call amused mastery or being at ease. It's when everything is kind of going wrong and you as the leader want to flip out, but you can't because the buck stops with you. And this is when I was a younger father and a younger husband, I didn't understand this as much. But as the kids piled on and things got more stressful, I realized uh, that this is a prudent action. And it's something that you have to steal inside yourself as a man and as a father and as a husband. That when everything is flipping out, you have to be the one who's the oak. You know, when that's the storms right. come, you're the oak. And I don't always do that perfectly, but that's my, I've realized that has to be my role in the family. It really is the role of the father that when things are going, everything is falling apart. He has to be the rock. Yeah. He's the rock. And because what happens is the wife and especially the children, they see that and they say, okay, yeah. things aren't that, things can't be that bad if dad is still calm. Not in the sense that it might be that you have a hard time getting food. You might be out of work. All these things are happening. But Ultimately, in divine providence, you're being taken care of. You're trusting that God will take care of you. Not that he'll prevent you from getting sick or prevent you from losing your job, but he will ultimately take care of you. And I think that is essential for, for our attitude. And the, re the way we do that is, and I'm, I fail like you do at times to do this, is we really, we, we want to have the proper perspective. We want to have divine perspective. That's what wisdom is. It's not knowledge. It's not smarts. It's not intelligence, wisdom is having God's perspective on things. Exactly. And so one thing that I believe takes us away from that wisdom is if we're constantly following the news and constantly following the panic that's being, that's being built up by listening to all the different things like this person now has coronavirus, that person has, it. okay, this, if you, I'm not saying we ignore the news because we need to know what's going on in order to be prudent in our own lives, whether or not we should be doing certain things. I get all that. But if your time is spent most of the day following Twitter, following whatever, to find out, okay, you know, how, what's the latest numbers, how many people are sick and dying, what's been shut down recently. And if you're constantly doing that, I believe you're losing that divine perspective that ultimately through all this, God is still in control. And so your day, and here's a practical uh, point that most of us, our days are now longer because we have, they're not filled as much. My, my son right now would normally be in the height of baseball season and I love going to his mm -hmm. games. Well, all that time now yep. is free. What do we do with that time? Do we spend it just anxiously following the news? Or have we decided to up our prayer game, to add time to our prayer, more spiritual reading, spending time with our kids doing wholesome activities? That's really what should be happening. And that will help reduce that anxiety. Mm -hmm. Because when you're sitting around playing a, a, a board game with your kids or putting a puzzle together or uh, like my son, I say he's a big baseball fan. You know what he's done? We have a big yard with the woods in it. He's got out my old golf clubs and he's learning to play, to, to hit the golf ball and yeah. he just shoots them into the, uh, into the woods. That's a great activity. It's a good, healthy way for a young man to expend that mm -hmm. physical energy he needs to do, uh, in a way that's still social distancing and all of that. Uh, and so I, I, I think those are type of things that I think help us as men and as men, particularly we need physical activities. Idleness is the devil's workshop. Yes, sir. And I was going to talk about this later, but I'll just bring it up right now. This is the time that I believe the devil will really work hard, particularly in the area of pornography mm -hmm. because pornography comes about through idleness often. And we are all going to be more idle because we're not going to be as active going out. Perhaps we're not, our schedule was going to the gym or something like that, or going into the workplace, all these different things that would keep us from the sins that, that come up from um, idleness. And I think obviously pornography is number one on that list. And so we have to redouble our efforts that we, that's another reason we don't spend, we don't 
fill up that extra time we have on the computer. I think that's probably the best way because being on the computer, the more you're on the computer, the more likely you are to right. uh, be tempted. And so we need to do these physical activities. If you have a big yard, you know, you have a blessing and use it to, to do activities. But even if you don't, take walks, uh, do things active with the kids, uh, whatever. If you have a basketball hoop outside, shoot hoops with your kids. I mean, the funny thing is I have my, my young daughters, my, my eight-year-old now is love shooting hoops because she's trying to find something to do. And, you know, we reduce the, we, we pull the, the mm -hmm. it down for her and she's taking shots yeah. too and she's loving it. But just all these things, we can be outside, be inactive. Uh, I do think, though, that all comes back to the non-anxious leadership because it reduces our anxiety and helps us to be that calm in the storm and that oak for the rest of the family. Yep, yep. Yeah, we had that last weekend. We, um, we've always wanted to take the kids skiing, which is expensive, especially when you have a lot of kids. So we finally <laughs> pulled the trigger on it. And we last Friday we checked, and Joy's parents live in Colorado, so we were going to be with them. And the resort said, yeah, come on. We're taking extra precautions to be healthy. The resort's open. So we drove up all Saturday. We got there late Saturday night. We did it all one day. And uh, that night, I read that all masses in the state were banned. I was like, whoa, no mass tomorrow. And then when we woke up in the morning, all resorts closed by executive degree of the governor. So then, I mean, and there, there was all these rumors too, you know, like Alex Jones and these people were saying interstate travel will be shut down within 24 right. hours. You know, there's all these things. And I said, you know, I don't want to be stuck in Colorado with eight kids in an Airbnb and in a Sonic for the next month. Right. You know, so I was, I mean, it was kind of, it's kind of stressful, but I was, you know, I was thinking and praying about it. I was like, we just need to get out. And nobody liked that decision that I made. But I think it was the prudent and the right decision. And I just said, okay, after dinner, we're packing up and we're driving out tonight. We'll get a hotel in the night and we need to get out of get home. So you lose a lot of money. You lose a lot of sleep. You know, kids are unhappy. Why aren't we having a vacation? And why aren't we seeing, you know, Grammy and Papa and, you know, all these questions. No one's happy. But, you know, you just sort of be the oak and you have to. That's another thing I think we didn't say is. When you're the father and the husband, you are the leader. You are the executive superior. And when you make a decision, A, you got to do it prayerfully and prudently, but then you have to stick with it. You know, you That's can't, right. you can't let a mutiny happen beneath you and you can't show that weakness because they'll right. peel it over, especially, you know, how many kids do you have, Eric? I forgot. Seven. Seven. I got eight. That's a lot of voices. They can peel you it open is. if you're soft. Right, right. So you got to you got to stick to your guns and and be firm and and uh, and move forward. And like you said, non anxious. Right. And you take that you you take that step of leadership. You step up in this time, and you and you really do lead. Obviously, your wife is going to be a um, counsel for you and is going to tell you what's going on. My wife and I, for example, were just this morning talking about how. Okay, so we. I work from home and we homeschool. So we already practice social distancing right. for the past, you know, number of years. <laughs> and so, but the, so we kind of thought in, when this all started happening in Ohio, really it was last, late last week, they started shutting everything down, telling everybody to stay at home, stuff like that. So we thought, well, we don't really have to change much. But it's interesting because this week we realized, okay, we do have to make some adjustments because the kids start going stir crazy because we forgot how often we go out with the kids. Right. The, like I said, my son, who's a teenager, he goes out for baseball. The, the little we, we take him to different places we can't go to now, uh, the zoo and places that get shut down and all that. And so we realize, okay, what we need to do is, and we're going to do this this weekend, is we're going to now set up a, a little bit more disciplined uh, regimen at home. Not like a military one, but just sense of, okay, make sure we're not sleeping in. We're still getting up at the at the right time. We're going. We, you know, my kids have online classes, so we're, we're obviously we're, we'll continue to do those. But now, what we're going to do is say, okay, let's add some activities, scheduled activities in the afternoon, for example. Like like I said, we have uh, some woods in our yard. Maybe go out and with the kids start to to explore those woods and say, okay, let's look for these type of plants and let's mm -hmm. do some research. Go online. Uh, one of the things my wife thought. I thought it was a good idea as well. But my wife thought up was uh, learn, teach them some art. Uh, how to? Mm -hmm. My oldest daughter is an, actually an artist, and so uh, I don't know. She doesn't get it from me, 
but uh, but the idea is, okay, go online and find some ways to teach the kids how to draw, how to create art, things like that. Things we would not have done otherwise. Let's spend some time on that now. But the idea is kids particularly need structure. If they feel like the whole world is just crazy and they don't know what's going to happen next, I think they their anxiety increases. And I think if we give them some structure, say, okay, now Mondays at two o'clock is going to be art class mm -hmm. that we wouldn't have had before, uh, whatever the case may be, all these different things we can do. But as, as the father, like I'm setting that up with my wife's consultation, what's needed and kind of, and, and letting the kids know this is how we're going to do things now. And yet there, there might be some things like, I don't want to do that. Like maybe one kid's like, doesn't hate art drawing. I don't want to do that. Okay, fine. But we're going to do this because as a family, this is what's best for us. Obviously adding times of prayer and things like that are, are, are important. Uh, and so I think all these things, I, I think really help us to lead our families, which is, Again, especially for the fathers out there, that's our primary responsibility at all times. It, nothing comes before our family. And so that's, that's who we're responsible for is leading them into heaven, the, the, the children and our wives into heaven. And so I think that's what we have to do, particularly in a time like this. It becomes more explicit than it might have been before. Yeah, absolutely. And along those lines of, you know, making time to do things that you normally wouldn't do. And of course, I mean, every father should be reducing or eliminating screen time or minimizing it, uh, TV and all that, you know, so that, but after dinner last night, uh, I think it was after we, we said the closing prayer and I said, now listen, kids, when you're 70 years old, you'll say back in 2020, I remember that we canceled school and we had to do you know, we couldn't go to school anymore and all of our sports were canceled and we had to stay home and we canceled our vacation. And you're going to have this story of this time. And it should be a time, hopefully, of great memories, right? of, of good things that happen. And I said, I, I don't want you guys to get run down and bored. I want you to make this time a time of memories, right? of good and things. And also, you want your kids someday telling their kids, I remember when in 2020, everything was going crazy. Your granddad, he, he led us. Yeah. He, he showed us the way that we should live. That's what you want your kids saying someday. That granddad was, was calm. He didn't freak out. And he, he kept his head. And he, he, he gave us an example. Mm. And, and so that's what you want your kids saying about you one day, is that you kept the calm. And, and I agree. It can be a time of great memories. I mean, last night it was funny. Uh, not really funny, but in a way, we we had a tornado come through, mm. and so it was like total end times. All of a sudden, the, the air <laughs> sirens went off, and our phones were buzzing, telling us the tornado. It was a tornado warning. It was an actual tornado had been sighted, and so one of our my, our youngest had already gone to bed upstairs. So we got her, brought her down. My my eight year old was like, "What about uh, Pluto? Pluto's our one of our cats who was outside." So I went out, and got Pluto, brought brought him in. We all went down to the basement. And we had to wait until the the sign was given that everything was okay. But we just sat down there. We had a good time hanging out in the basement, all of us. And like it's it's something they're gonna remember. Here, the cats are down there with yeah. us, and and we're just hanging out and we're talking about you know just various things. And and, and so that's a memory that is a negative. A tornado obviously turns into a positive. Like oh yeah, I still actually remember when I grew up in Cincinnati, which is where I am now, which is where tornadoes like to come through sometimes. I still remember as a kid when tornadoes would come through and my parents would get us down in the basement and mm -hmm. put us under the table and all that. And it, it's something that's memorable. And so you want to make it a good memory for them that you're, that you've not lost your head. And, you know, we say a prayer and all that, that type of stuff you want to do. Yeah. And, and related to that, not just, you know, having good memories, but having good memories about our Catholic faith. You know, like you want, you want your kids to say, yeah, I remember we couldn't go to mass for, I don't know how, I don't know how long it's going to be. We'll just say three weeks, which is hope, right? That's we hope, couldn't go right? to mass for three weeks. So dad got the missile out and we lit candles and we, we got a crucifix out. We even lit some incense maybe, you know, and, and I remember we, we sang a hymn and, you know, dad would read the missile and then he would explain the epistle and the gospel to us. And it was really, you know, it was really something, you know, I'm really glad I had a dad who took charge on Sunday morning and, and let us, even though we couldn't go to mass. Right. You want that. You don't just want it because it's memory. You want it because it's good. It's, it's, it's right. just and right. 
And the, and the truth is we, we can make good out of these things because, for example, Sunday, as we know, is supposed to be a day of worshiping God and, of, and serving others and of rest. Yeah. And Sunday is supposed to be different. And it can, from the habit of going to Mass each week, it can just be kind of, that's what you do on Sunday. Yeah. But if now in this time when we can't go to Mass, we still make Sunday morning a time that is set aside to the worship of God, that will, I think, in a way, even be more impress even mm-hmm. more upon our kids that Sunday is a time that's different than any other day. And so even when you can't go to Mass, you still set aside this time for worship and things like that. And I think there's a number of things. Uh, you, you had a great, I thought your video the other night was great about things we can do. And I think you know, some people will want to uh, stream uh, a, li- a, a Mass mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's a great thing. I, I think that's part of what we're going to do is we're going to set up a uh, under the TV. We're going to put some. Uh, we're going to put some statues. We're going to actually bring out chairs and set them up. Yep. We're not going to sit in the easy chair, the yep. recliner. Make a chapel. We're going to dress like we're going to mass. Mm-hmm. I'm going to wear my jacket and tie. The kids are going to wear. The girls going to wear their dresses, and everything. And we're going to sit there, and we're going to. And we're going to do and do the uh, watch the mass online. And there's a lot of great different ones. Figure out which one's a good one to really make it. What is a good one? I've been looking around. What do you think? Okay, LiveMass.net okay. is, I believe, the go-to one. It was actually started by an uh, old pastor of mine when I was down in Sarasota, FSSP. Okay, and they have streams from multiple locations: Sarasota, Florida. That's where it started. England, Los Angeles, Mexico. I think in Switzerland. So they have them different times a day, and it's a it's always they they had to bump up their uh, serving capacity because they crashed last week because of the fact that all of a sudden so many people. But they've ramped it up. Father Fryer, who's in charge of it, he's ramped it up. And is this and TLM? I, what is this? Oh yeah, traditional it's, it's, Latin it's, it's, mass. It's only it's all FSSP. Uh, Legit. So it's all Fraternity of Saint Peter. Legit. So yes, it's only TLM. Hey, if you're gonna stream mass, stream TLM, folks. Come on. And guy, okay, just a real people will listen to this. If you normally go to the ordinary form and you're a little intimidated by going to the traditional Latin Mass, now it's time. Here's your opportunity. Nobody's going to see you. There you, you go. You're going to be sitting there at home watching it. Ladies, you can you wear can, your mantillas at home. It, nobody's Put them on. Think, I mean, you just got your family there. So here's the opportunity to do it. There are also a number of other uh, places that are streaming. Uh, uh, St. John Cancius up in Chicago, I yeah, know, I heard that one. is doing it. Um, the, uh, a number of the uh, Society of uh, Pius X mm-hmm. are streaming yep. uh, from different places. So I think what you do is you figure out if you let's say you have if you have a TV at home, uh, you figure out what's the easiest way to stream on your TV. Yeah. Uh, for example, I don't know if I can do live mass on mine because I have a Roku TV and it. There's not it's not the compatibility and great. Okay. But so I might do something else. But I'd say go to livemass.net first because you're guaranteed you're getting a uh, TLM that they have good quality, but like I said, others do it through YouTube. Uh, and, and so you can get some good stuff there. So, and I, but I think, like I said, though, when you do it, try to make it as much like going to mass as you can set up chairs, dress, uh, maybe speak a little bit beforehand as a father, uh, to the kids about making sure it's clear to them. This isn't the yeah. same. This is not equivalent, but it's the best we can do. And God right. always wants our best. And that's what you asked for. And yeah, right you now, explain to the kids, you know, I'm yes. going up to college saying, I'm just going to do home church through college. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> so you do the Eric, best. we were thinking about like getting some felt banners, putting those up, getting some Purell <laughs> pumps, you know, I was going to, when we live stream, I was going to make the, uh, the TV off to the side. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay. Oh. So live mass.com. I know that, uh, Trinity top, which is the fraternity parish in rome my favorite place to go when i'm in rome uh they're streaming now as well you know another thing that i've been hearing about which i think is really beautiful is fathers and mothers baptizing their newborn babies they can't some of these people can't get a priest from the parish to come baptize their baby they're not going to wait months i think and i think I, it's right i, right. I, I I'm commend not, them can yeah i'm not a canon lawyer but I would absolutely do the same thing yes. because we we know our faith believes that baptism is necessary for salvation. Absolutely, and that a and secondarily we know from from uh, practice traditional practice over the centuries that you want to baptize your child as soon as possible after birth, 
Uh, and so that's why, for example, in normal times, you would not wait more than a couple, uh, maybe two to three weeks before you'd have a baptism of a child. Well, in, that's in, the way you in, should do it. In traditional Catholic times, more than a few days. Right. Yes. Normally it would be now because of our medical advances the cha- you know, usually I think most people now yeah, go good. a couple weeks. But the, the fact is now we're not in normal times. And so, yes, if you have a baby and a priest can't come for a month or two or you don't know how long, then you you, bat, you baptize the child yourself and go to your old your video from earlier this week on how to do that to make sure you do it properly. And I and because the I, it's a scandal that we would hold off baptisms, yeah. uh, confessions or anything like that. That's a scandal. I, I, I understand the prudential arguments about the public celebration of mass, but baptism is necessary for salvation. Now, fortunately, though, of course, anybody can baptize, right. even an atheist can baptize. So, yes, parents, if you if you if you can't get your bat, your kid bat, baptized, do it. And you don't know when it can happen. You, you have to do it. And do then it. what you do is just to make it clear after the this all passes, you go to your priest and you say, OK, I baptized my child. And I think you asked for conditional baptism. No, and I think so. No. Because if you did it wrong. No. I mean, that's what, when I read Bishop Schneider, he was telling the story about when they lived there, a priest would come. And when they would come like once every few years, they would come say, okay, everybody, all the moms who baptized their kids in last year, come here, bring them all here. I'm going to do a conditional baptism all just to make sure everybody oh. is, is okay. legit. I mean, definitely and supply thought, the right. Okay. For sure. Right. Supply yeah. the and right I, means, you know, you do the exorcism, you do the candle, the garment you know, all the extra rituals surrounding baptism. But, um, okay, well, maybe maybe you conditional them because mom got it wrong. I don't know. Right. And, and just so you know, everyone, here I, I said it the other day on the Tuesday video, here's how you baptize validly. You say, name, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen. Or name, like Eric, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You do not say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Three names. That's invalid. That's not what Jesus taught us in Matthew 28. That's a common um, invalid formula that should never be used. That's If you're going to mess it up, that's probably how you're going to mess it up. So don't do that. Um, and then you must have water clean water and traditionally the person is immersed or water is poured on the skin of the head three times as i said on tuesday night if someone has a lot of gel in their hair and the water doesn't get down to their skin no bueno it doesn't count there needs to be this is why it's usually poured on the forehead water must run on the skin of the head while you say i baptize you in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit if you do that the person is indwelt with the Holy Trinity. Their original sin is remitted. Uh, they have faith, hope, and charity in their heart. They're a new creation. They're saved. If they die in that moment, they will go straight into the beatific vision without one microsecond of purgatory. They are totally purified. That's why it is so, so, so very important, especially during a time of plague. Right? So that's how you baptize. Did I, did I mess anything up, Eric? Give me a sounds, imprimatur on that. Yeah, I, I do. And, and just it's a it's a beautiful sign of God's mercy that he allows every, anybody to baptize yes. because he knows this is how you get to heaven. He's not going to put up any barrier to it. He is going to make it as as readily available as possible. Yep. And so any any bishop or priest who has withholding the ability of of uh, giving out baptism, is it, it's a terrible thing. But fortunately, God works around that by giving all of us the yep. power to uh, administer that sacrament in, in necessity. Yeah. I wanted to go back to something you were saying there, Eric, about Bishop Schneider. People who watch my channel, who watch you, who who follow you on Twitter, they know we love Bishop Schneider. I mean, yeah. let's just say he's grade A, number one kind of bishop. And as I read his book, Christus Vincit, right? As you mentioned, he grew up without regular mass. His parents did not have regular mass. And as I read it, even before this whole Corona thing happened, I thought, you know, here is one of the most orthodox, stalwart, vocal bishops. I mean, he's he's asking for clarification from Pope Francis on the permissive will in the Abu Dhabi document. He's an auxiliary from Kazakhstan. He's, he's so stalwart and vocal, and yet of all the bishops in the world, 
minus a few who also lived in under regimes. He was the one who grew up not going to mass every Sunday because of persecution. Did that pressure create the diamond? And maybe I, this pressure now will create future diamonds. That's my hope. And one thing to make clear, some people might misunderstand and make it seem like we're almost implying the mass doesn't matter. But what we're saying is, is that we are called to follow God in the way he lays out in the best way we can. And so if mass is available and you don't go, it's a mortal sin and you're rejecting God. Right. And it's a terrible thing. That is different than mass is not available. So it's you are given graces and your your openness to receiving graces is based upon your actions and whether or not you are responding to and following the way God wants you to live. Yeah. And so now we're in a situation. So, so we're not even suggesting that mass is unimportant. But what we are saying is that God is so merciful and so awesome that when we have situations like this, where mass is taken away from us, that and, and even more serious, like Bishop Schneider lived under, where there was no priest. I think he said at one point his mom did not see a priest for 10 years. I, I think before he was born, even as before he was born, he went, she went through almost the entire 1950s, I think it was, without, without a priest. And then they started having one that would come like once every year or so. And I do think that's exactly what we see is the saints are those who they step up, they step up in times of challenge and they really show their mettle. And I think, think about the great saints we have from the early church during the times of the persecutions when they had to live underground. And we're not at a case where we have to live underground yet, but we are in a situation now where we're deprived of graces we normally would give, we normally receive. And so it's a time for us to step up. And I do think it's like uh, the diamond being produced, that there's a reason Bishop Schneider is one of our best bishops and best examples today is because of that deprivation he had as a child made him realize at a very early age and because of the example of his parents made him realize that the Eucharist is something that is above all things because he couldn't receive it regularly it became more important for him right. and so and that's also what led him to just throw out a, a controversial thing today is it also is what led him to believe that we shouldn't receive communion in the hand Yes, is because he has such a high view of the Eucharist, which was developed because he was deprived of it at a young age that has led him to realize that when we do receive it, when we are given the, the ability to go to mass, that we should treat it like it is this solemn and beautiful worship of God and the body, blood, soul, and divinity. And so we receive it accordingly. And so all these things are interconnected. There's not it's not like one is unrelated to the other. I really do think that they're that they're connected to each other. So my hope is that this time is a time of of really us becoming saints. And I know there's some people are focused on the fact that it might lead to a loss in the sense that people who were going to mass for no reason really other than habit, now once they break the habit, they stop going. And I do think that will happen to some people. But all it's doing is it's making clear outwardly what was already the reality inwardly. Right. If they were going to mass out of habit and they didn't really believe, then they were likely uh, receiving condemnation on themselves, as St. Paul would, would say. And so I think if that happens, that happens. But what I'm hoping is those who do believe, and even those maybe those on the fence who were, they were going and they kind of believe, but their faith was weak. This is that jolt that God gives them to kick it up a gear and really be uh, be a saint, which is what we're called to be. It, it's actually, I don't want, this might come out wrong, but it's in a sense easier to be a saint in a time of trial than it is in a time of comfort. I think that's probably right. Uh, and so we should thank God in, in one sense for this time because it, it, it's giving us more opportunities than we have before to be saints. Yes, yes. I remember uh, hearing Bishop Schneider in November when he was here in the States and he was talking about uh, at one point when they were going west, and I, th I think, I, I want to say that it was when they came into Germany, but I can't remember which European nation it was. might not have been Germany. 
But this was, uh, you know, the changes were happening and they heard that communion in the hand was being done and they were completely scandalized. Yeah. That was Germany. Yeah. 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 Because, and, and they had only received probably, Bishop Snyder at that point in his life had probably only received a, a small number of times ever. Yeah. And such a big but deal. that has since made it a really big deal. Exactly. Yeah. When I went on a retreat uh, last October, it was a week long silent retreat. It was wonderful uh, by some traditional monks in Australia. They came to the States. And one of the things they, so it's a, it's a retreat from Sunday through Friday. You show up Sunday afternoon and then you, you're there till Friday evening. And one of the things they do is they do not, you do not receive communion on Monday or Tuesday morning. They restrict communion only to the priest. And because what's happening is it, it was it was based upon the spiritual exercise of St. Ignatius. And what it was is basically because on Sunday evening, Monday, Tuesday morning, you're focused on the ways that you have followed the kingdom of man, the kingdom of the devil, instead of the kingdom of God. Right. And so you're focused on your sins and the ways you've rejected God. And then on Tuesday afternoon, you make this a confession. You're allowed to make a, con a, a regular confession, but you're also allowed to make a general confession where you confess all the sins of your entire life. And so, and that's what I did. And that's, I think I assume probably most people did. So we make this general confession on Tuesday, then you receive communion on Wednesday morning. And that communion on Wednesday morning is so powerful because you were deprived of communion on Monday and Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And you then do this entire confession on, to, on Tuesday afternoon to really free yourself of all the burdens of sin. When you receive that that you the Eucharist on that Wednesday morning, it is such a beautiful thing. And I thought it was interesting because he had to explain it to us because a lot of the people there were daily communicants. He's like, I understand you're used to receiving communion every day. And that's a good thing. I'm not saying anything against it. However, we do this because we want you to realize how important the Eucharist is and to be deprived of it for even two days for those of us, for those of the people who, who go every day, it, 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 it focuses the mind and it focuses the soul. And I think that's exactly what's happening here is we're now going to be deprived of communion for we don't know how long. And so that's the time now we repent. We hopefully where you live, there's still confessions are still available. If not, this is important to note. I'm sure you mentioned this in your last episode is uh, there is such thing as per a perfect act of contrition. Yes. If you feel you are in danger of death and a, you cannot get to a priest, is it is the teaching of the church that you can make an act of contrition that can be salvific, meaning that it can save you, even a mortal sin, even a mortal sin. If you're in a state where you can't get to confession because God wants you in heaven, that's always the important thing to remember. He wants you in heaven. So he's going to make it available to you. And so let's say you're in a state of mortal sin and you can't get to confession and you feel like even if you don't feel like you're in danger, but especially if you feel like you're in danger of death, make that act of contrition. Give your heart completely to God and tell him you're sorry. Make sure it's very clear. You make it very clear in your head that you are a sinner in need of his mercy and you will not get to heaven without him. And God can save you through that act. Now, one part of that is, is you're also saying, if I recover and if I can get to confession, I will go as my first opportunity to go. That needs right. to be part of the intention of your act of contrition is that you will go to a sacramental confession at your first opportunity to go. Not when you feel like it later, but literally the first time you can go, you need to go because that shows you really have that intention. So those are the type of things we, we only think of now because confession is not so readily available. But I, I, I want people, that's another thing to keep you from being non-anxious is that there are the means of salvation available to us even at a time when we're deprived of the sacraments. That's right. Yeah, it, it's amazing in the Catholic Church that even if you can't get to sacramental confession and absolution it is magisterial teaching that you can still be safe through a perfect act of contrition which is very difficult to do and a perfect act of contrition i talk about this on the video how to, catholics under quarantine this was on tuesday night but i'll just summarize it again here because i know not everybody was there you must be perfectly sorrowful for your mortal sin not because you're afraid to go to hell or because you're afraid of purgatory, or you're afraid to lose heaven, but because you have broken the heart of God, because you've broken a bond of charity with God. And most of us, because of our 
our lukewarmness, it's very hard for us to stir up and rouse that kind of love for God. But we must attempt to do it. We must repeatedly attempt to do it. And anytime you commit a mortal sin, even if it's not under a time like this, you should always try to make an act of per perfect contrition and continue to repeat it. In fact, even if you're not in mortal sin, you should try to make acts of perfect contrition. We want to cease from sin out of a perfect love for the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It's love. That's what Christianity is. It's love. God is love. We want to correspond our rational appetite, our will, to the love of God. So, I mean, for me, Eric, thinking about these things, it's it's making me rethink my Catholicism. Again, we're not saying it's okay not to have mass or confessions, but I, I'm, I'm rethinking. You know, it's it's kind of lazy Catholicism for me to just think, well, I'll just, you know, I'll go to confession every two weeks and just sort of, you know, it's kind of right. like changing the oil in the car, you know? No. If there is no confession, that means that perfect charity, perfect penance is what's being called for. And shouldn't I be striving for that anyway? Ab if, yeah, absolutely. And I think it does focus the mind. And, and for example, you're saying about perfect acts of contrition. They are difficult to make. But mm -hmm. one thing that's interesting is I think the closer you are to death, the easier they are to make. Because the closer you are to death, the more focused you get on what's important, hopefully. And so you're, you're more likely to say, if you're near death, that I am sorry that I have broke, broken your heart, God. And I think also what you're saying about the fact is that I do think this time has can be a time in which we draw closer to God. It's the fundamental reality of the Catholic faith is that God brings good out of evil. Mm -hmm. Because what is the fundamental action of history? That is the crucifixion. It was evil for those men to kill our Lord. Yes. It was objectively evil for them to do it. There's, there is zero good in that. In fact, it was literally the most evil act that's ever been performed in the history of mankind was when those men killed our Lord Jesus Christ. Yet, what is the greatest act of good that's ever happened in the history of mankind? The crucifixion of, of our Lord, when he gave up his life for our salvation. It's the way our salvation is possible. And so that is always been a truth of our faith, is that God works good out of evil. And that's the story of, of the Bible, too. You look at the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. the, the Israelites constantly, they constantly go against God. I mean, oh, happy fault, which we sadly probably won't hear this year from many of us because we won't be able to go to Mass on Easter. Oh, happy fault. What does it mean? It means it's actually turned out for our benefit that Adam and Eve sinned. That we're in better, we're in a better situation because of that. Because because of the sin of Adam, he our, our Lord deigned to to bring uh, a redeemer to become man. And so I do think applying that practically to us, I think what it says is we hopefully will focus more. I, I'm like you. I at least I. It sounds like I did not have a habit of making acts of contrition on a regular basis. Yeah. I would just depend on confession. Right. I'd go regularly to confession and be like, I'll be fine until confession. That's not the attitude of a saint. Mm. The saint says every single day, I want to live in a way that I glorify God and that if I die tonight, I know I can face the Lord knowing that I was faithful to him and I will hear the words, good and faithful servant, enter into your reward. Yeah. Every single day, not, oh, you know, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to get to confession and now, you know, I'll be good then. Yeah. And uh, that's that that's I, that was my attitude. And I and it's this has helped me yes. see that's not the attitude to have because I might not be able to go to confession in a couple of weeks. And so therefore, I need to to today make an act of contrition. And I believe the St. Alphonsus who suggested like six times a day or something like that. Somebody some yeah, that was uh, spiritual yeah. communion. Okay. Oh, spiritual communion. Yes. Okay, spiritual communion six yes. times a day. Spiritual right, communion. Right. Yeah, I, I can't remember if it was six, but it was something like that every day. Right, right. So yeah. definitely do that. But I also think an act of contrition in the morning and before you go to bed at night, maybe in, at noon or something like that, is a, is a good is a good thing to do. Yeah. And 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 uh, here's a, a tip. Maybe this is just works for me, but if I want to rouse contrition in my heart, I think about my sins causing pain to Jesus on the cross. Right. Like adding an extra burden to him in that moment. 
Like he's right. so much suffering for me. And then I'm just like, oh, here, I'm just going to stab you with this or, you know, I'm going to open up another right. wound on your forehead, you know, like, and that's, that's kind of breaks your heart. You think, man, why would I do that to him? Right. Why when we sin, we're not our lady at the foot of the cross yes. or Mary at the foot of the cross. Instead, we are one of the soldiers right. doing the nail or mocking him or something like right. that. That's exactly. What and we're Mary's doing. there watching it hurt him more. Right. And she's in, exactly. So I think those are the type of things that they, they focus the mind on what's mm -hmm. important. And I think all these things that were being taken from us, they, they say, you know, non-essential activities are not allowed anymore. Uh, uh, different governments are saying that. And in a sense, we need to realize in our spiritual life, most of our activities are non-essential. <laughs> and so all the things we do, and there's nothing wrong with recreation and leisure. Those are good things, mm -hmm. and they can, they, can, they can make us more holy even. But if we're spending most of our time uh, watching television or surfing the internet, stuff like that, that's a lot of non-essential activities in the spiritual life. Right. And so we need to take away those as much as possible. Yeah. What about indulgences? Uh, I think it was either last night or this morning that the apostolic penitentiary in Rome uh, modified the rules for indulgences because in order to receive a plenary indulgence, you must go to confession and receive communion right. and pray for the intentions of the Pope and do the indulgence act. Clearly, so many of us can't go to confession and can't receive communion. I haven't read the decree yet, but I'm going to presume that it says an act of contrition and a spiritual communion are sufficient. Have you read it yet, Eric? I have not. I just saw it this morning, though, and they've also added a number of activities related to the virus okay. that uh, will give you a plenary indulgence. And so, for example, those who are sick, uh, they, there are certain prayers. If, oh, if we pray for those who are for medical workers, they get plenary indulgences, which I think is a great thing. You want to expand plenary indulgences yes. uh, rather than contract. And I think it's a. I'm very happy that they've done this, but I have not either read the decrees yet. I've only s seen that they've added certain ac activities as now giving you a plenary indulgence. And I assume the same as you, although I haven't seen it, that obviously we can't do the communion and the confession. Right. And so I'm assuming they're they're giving that to some replacement or something to allow us to, to receive those. Yes. So that was nice because I, I saw Father Z maybe yesterday day before said that uh, those with care of souls, curia animorum, which I think would be bishops and pastors, can commute in times of exceptional need. But it's right. great to see that it actually came from Rome to the whole church. Yes. Everything's covered. You don't have to call your pastor and say, hey, can you commute attending, you know, right. receiving communion and, and uh, going to confession for my family? It's everybody's got it now. And also I saw where in certain areas where it's hitting hardest, they have granted the ability for priests to give uh, general absolution, mm -hmm. which I think, which obviously always during war times this is given. And I know we had the funny season of the, like the seventies where all of a sudden they abused that. And so I know the kind of the, the normal reaction of a traditional Catholic might be to not like general absolution. And I understand that because it was abused, yes. but this is actually what's, this, these are the times where it's made for. And because if you get sick, you might not be able to get to a priest. And so being able to give out general absolution in these situations. Well, you is need another a priest to have general absolution, Eric. Yeah. But I'm saying is what they're doing is they're allowing priests, as I understand, I have not read it completely, but as I understand it is they're allowing priests in certain areas to go and like, basically my assumption is something like a town, the priest could be outside like let's say some Italian town that's hit very hard, and he could give a general absolution. I don't to think so. You various... have to be you have to be able to hear the absolution for it to be valid. Well, no, I meant I'm sorry. I'm actually picturing where the people are like at their windows, like these small Italian towns. Oh, okay. where, where I'm I'm picturing something oh, like I that. See. I'm not yeah, picturing yeah. like oh, I see. He's yeah, not... like on the outskirts of town, just like right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, where I, I'm saying like you know because like some of these priests are going through towns with the the the, the, the Eucharistic procession or something like that. Uh, my understanding is, and don't we need to look this up for the details, but right. that it's been said these are this is a situation no, where you could have you could have the townspeople come to the windows. But right. I, as I understand, in order for the sacrament of penance to be valid, the words of absolution have to be heard or received. Right. By so, like you could have you're you're in war, and you know there's a guy you know maybe he's drowning. 
and he's 50 feet, the priest could absolve him and he could be absolved. But if he's five miles away, I don't think. Right. Or, or like the troops are all lined up and the priest gets in front of yes. them and basically just says, okay, everybody here is absolved yes. and does. We're about the, to go into Normandy. Form. I don't have time to right. hear 2000 confessions. Right. Most of you are going to die. I absolve you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy right. Ghost. I mean, I hopefully you do it in Latin, not the English. And then they open the convoy and so right. it begins. Yeah. And I, and I believe that's, that's the kind of scenarios we're talking about here where a area that's hit very hard where they can't, get out and go to confession, but they can, you know, be in a, some type of like, you know, you see like they leaning out the windows and things like that. Right. So and, and, which I think it's and, a good, and what, in a general absolution, the penitents must have the intention to attend confession if right. they live through it. So it's not just like, well, I was good back in 2020. Right. If in June of 2020, everything's back to normal, you still need to go to confession. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. That's that's part of it. So I think all these things are good and they, they show how the church has. I mean, the church has seen everything. This right. is not something new. And so that's why she has developed all these different ways to make sure God's grace is poured out to us mm -hmm. in these times of trial. And so that that's the great thing. Things like uh, plenary indulgences uh, with exceptions. And the church has remember, the church has the keys is the power to bind and loose. Therefore, it can change man different uh, obligations like the obligation to go to confession community get plenary indulgence right. those are the type of things that church can control and can can change the rule rule and how they do that in different situations based upon prudence and and the current situation yeah. awesome okay so let's pivot here on the on the end of the show and talk about how we can evangelize people this seems almost impossible uh, you can't take your friend who's inquiring about Catholicism to talk to your priest. Uh, I guess you could. Um, you could give him a phone number, but it's not like, hey, well, why don't you come to Mass and me and you can meet the priest afterwards. That's not going to happen. Um, I'm hearing from people who are catechumens, meaning unbaptized, and they're hearing from their pastors. These are mostly diocesan places. Yeah, you're probably not going to get baptized at Easter. Uh, one young lady, congrats to her. This happened to her. I saw her on Twitter. I saw that. Yeah. And she said the, you know, the pastor, it looked like she wasn't going to get baptized. She couldn't get a hold of anyone. She called a fraternity of St. Peter priest. God bless him. He said, you're catechized. You're ready. Come up to the office. I'll baptize you. And I think she got confirmed. I can't remember. In, uh, enrolled her in the scapular. She's in. Yeah. She's inside yeah. Jesus Christ. She's a member of the Catholic church. She has sanctifying grace. The Holy Trinity dwells within her. She is. She dies. She would go straight into the beatific vision. Thanks be to God for that priest. So I think, Eric, we should talk about practical elements because there's a lot of people who are scared, who are fearful. People are actually thinking about death now. Memento Mori. Right. You know, they're not just thinking about what's their new outfit or what TV show they're going to binge watch. They're now thinking, Ooh, what if I die? What if grandma dies? What if my husband dies? Right. So this is a time of of evangelization, but how do we do it? I think a couple things. One thing about the not receiving people at Easter and things like that, I've thought for a long time we need to burn the bureaucracy to the ground, which includes RCIA. RCIA is dumb. And so, yeah, and so I think doing, I think hopefully this will help foster that. Mm -hmm. But practically for us, I think a couple things. First of all, there's a, a book I read long ago, a pretty well-known book by uh, the sociologist Rodney Stark, yeah. who's not a Catholic. He wrote about the rise of Christianity in the early church. How did it go from being a handful of people to 300 years later, taking over the most powerful empire in the world? And he wanted to look at it from a human standpoint, a sociological standpoint. He even said, I'm not saying divine providence had something to do with it. But at the same time, people were the instruments. How did this happen? Looking at it strictly from a human standpoint. One of the key ways that Christianity spread was that during times of plague, when a town would all of a sudden go under plague, the pagan elites, what would they do? They'd run out of town. What would the Christians do? They would stay and they would even come in to care for the sick and the dying. Mm -hmm. And when they were asked, why, why are you doing this? They would say, because my Lord has commanded me and you are, I've been told that as I take care of the least of these, I take care of my Lord. And what would happen is even in plagues, people would recover. Not everybody died. And the example they gave, the Christians gave, converted many, many people. And when you look at the numbers and how this happened, that was a big part of it. So I think that's one thing we do 
is we don't live in fear. Now, I'm not saying we live imprudently either, but there's a balance between prudence and fortitude. And they're not really opposed to each other ever. I know that. But in the way we think about it, there's prudence in that we do not go against uh, reason and we, we take steps to protect those in need and those most vulnerable. We also have fortitude, though, meaning we don't cut and run because there might be a danger to us or something like that. And so, for example, we still help those around us. And I think that's a big thing we can do to evangelize right now is we are taking care of our families. We've taken care of potentially extended family members, like parents or something like that who need it. But we also are neighbors. So, for example, let's say the next door neighbor is an older couple. You go over there, you, you make sure you, you keep your distance and all that in case they're afraid and, and they don't. And, but you let them know, is there anything I can do for you? Would you like me to go to the store for you? I can leave it here on the porch for you. You know, I, I will take all the steps I can. I'm assuming, by the way, the person who does this is is healthy and they, they don't know that they have it. Obviously, somebody could have it and not know it, but we can't just stop living completely. We have to do some things. And one of the things I think we do is we do things like that. Uh, we continue to do things like, as long as that abortion clinic stays open, we go and pray in front of it. My wife actually is, right, is there right now as we speak awesome. with, with the kids praying there wow. and they, they they do the things of keeping social distance and all that right. we're, we're not trying to we're not we're not like being idiots like going on spring break you know down the florida and partying it up i'm not like us we're not seeing that. yeah <laughs> yeah, <laughs> going to yeah. Colorado. yeah like going to Colorado. yeah <laughs> yeah you didn't know yet um <laughs> but yeah and so but we help those who are in need in our parish. If there's somebody we know of who is in need, we, we help them out and we using the best prudence we can, but ultimately we do have to bring them. We do have to help them. Obviously if a family, if your next door neighbor can't go out and get food, they're going to die anyway. So bringing them food is a good thing to do. Even if it, it ends up that you did have the virus, you didn't know it, you did your best. And so I think that we're not fearful. If we get, if we, if you get the virus because you were helping others, you're working at the local soup kitchen, which has to stay open because otherwise mm -hmm. people are going to starve or because you help somebody, that is a uh, meritorious action on your part. And you can use that suffering you would get from being sick for – and the, the good news is most people who get it, it'll just – It'll, it'll suck when you have it, but it's not going to kill you, fortunately, for most people. But, you know, you can offer up that suffering. But I think these are the type of things we we, we think of those in need and we, we reach out. I think that's a great means of evangelization because when not only will our kids say, OK, dad kept his head. But when this all passes, our neighbors and those around us will say, you know, when, the, when, this, when everything went down, those people, they actually looked out for other people. They weren't just thinking of themselves. They were thinking of others and how they could help other people. Why did they do that? And now you have your opportunity to say it's because my Lord Jesus Christ commanded me to do it. And I am a Catholic, and as Catholics, we are to, to care for those in need. So I think that's a, 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 a big way practically every single person listening to this can do something to evangelize through that. I also think practically that because we're all thinking of death now that we aren't before, there will be people in your life who it will affect them and it will perhaps lead them to, into fear and they might fear death. And as Catholics, we should not fear death. Death is not the worst thing that can happen to us. And I think that we should always remember that, that death is not the ultimate evil, that the ultimate evil is hell, is sin. One sin is worse than the death of every single human being who ever lived. I mean, that sounds crazy, but it's true. And so therefore, we need to give that perspective to those around us that death is not something to be afraid of, but something to be prepared for. That's the, probably the best way to, to think of it. And so when you have a friend who maybe hasn't been living the Christian life, and now they are afraid of death, you're not going to them and saying you should be afraid of death because they already are. You're saying, okay, how can we prepare for it? Because the fact is you may not die from this, but I guarantee you, 100% guarantee you, you will die. It might be this year. It might be in 2080. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it will happen. And so how can we be prepared for it? And that's a great opening to talk about. And I do think over the past 50, 60 years, we shy away from discussions of hell. And I think that's a, been a huge mistake. 
And when I, in my book, The Old Evangelization, I have a whole chapter on that where I talk about we have to bring up hell. And so if somebody's afraid of death, the worst thing you can do is basically say, well, when you die, you're going to go to heaven and things will be fine. That's the worst thing you can say. Right. What you say is if you are prepared for death properly, then you will spend eternity in heaven. And this, all this will seem like nothing to you. And you, you, you'll kind of laugh at yourself for even being scared of death. Right. But that also assumes, and you might need to say it explicitly, if you're not prepared for death, what you're going through now will also be a laugh to you, but in the other way, because you'll realize how much worse your reality is because you'll be in hell for all eternity. And so I think we do these things, we, we make it very clear that death, if we're prepared for death, it's not something to be afraid of, but if we're not prepared for death, we should be terrified of it. Mm -hmm. And so we help those around us who, who are now thinking about death to think of those things. Yeah. And, and to add to that, people will die. Absolutely. Uh, Corona is going to get people in America. Or all over the, It's already happening. People are dying of Corona. By the way, everybody pray for Alexander Chugwell, the young man who threw the Pachamamas off the bridge in Rome. It's not doing well. Infection in the lungs, not doing well. He's a big guy. He's tall. Y'all have seen pictures with me and him, and everyone's like, wow, I didn't know Marshall was a midget. I'm not a midget. <laughs> like 5'11", but he's 6'8", I think. He's got big lungs, you know, and the infection gets in there and he's not doing well. So everybody pray a rosary. I just keep thinking of him and praying for him continually. But we need to pray for the people who are really sick and for the people who will die. People are going to die. And, and you know what? You might, you might be huddled down and you might get flu A and be 75 years old and you might die this season. Right. from the flu. You might get in a car wreck on the way to buy bread or toilet paper for your house. You might die. So I think an important, you know, this kind of goes back to the Old Testament is when there's plague and famine and invasions, memento mori, remember that you will die. Remember death. And so what can we do to prepare for death ourselves and for other people? We need to teach this because the they used to call it the art of dying. The art of dying has been lost. So here's what you need to do. You need to encourage people who are not baptized to be baptized. You need to hound them. I know a lady. Urge them, not just encourage them, urge them. Urge to them. Be baptized. I know a lady whose father was not baptized. He was in his, he was old. I can't remember the ages. We'll just say 70s, 80s. And she would bring him to mass with him. And she would say, you know, you need to get baptized, dad. You got to get baptized. One day he said, I want to be baptized. She went to the priest. I think it was a fraternity priest. I can't remember. And he said, well, this guy's old and he's confessing the faith. I've seen him coming to mass. I'm going to baptize him right now. Went and got the font ready after mass, randomly baptized this old man. He died that night, people. He died that night. Probably went straight to heaven or checked in for two seconds in purgatory. He died that night. Now, what if that woman didn't urge her father, you got to get baptized, dad? What if she was just sort of like a happy, clappy modernist? Oh, we all love the transcendent. Everyone's going to make it. Or just kind of the Bishop Baron, I'm an optimist on all these things. No, you got to urge people. So if you know people who aren't baptized, hey, you need to be baptized. Secondly, make act of contritions, teach people act of contritions, teach people how to baptize. Also, there's sacramentals, the brown scapular, the miraculous metal. These things are powerful. They're not sacraments. They're sacramentals. So it depends on our, our faith, what we bring to these things. But wearing the brown scapular, wearing the miraculous metal, having crucifixes, setting up your home, holy water, all these things. Now is a great time to get serious about that. You might think, oh, I haven't worn a brown scapular in a couple of years. Uh, go on Amazon.com and order yourself one. It'll show up at your house in two to five days. And the great thing about the brown scapular is once you're enrolled, you don't have to get a new one blessed. You're blessed. You just wear the brown scapular. So anything else we should add on that, Eric? Uh, I don't. I, I think those are, the, those are the most important things. Live out your faith. Help those in need. But also urge people to return to God if they've fallen away from him. Mm -hmm. If they're, if they were a baptized Catholic and they're fallen away, urge them to make acts, acts of contrition. If confession is still available in your area, urge them to go to confession. Uh, I'm 
willing to bet, and I, I don't want to get anybody in trouble or anything like that, but I'm willing to bet even in areas where confession is not available, if you contact certain priests and tell them a situation in which confession is needed, I'm willing to bet they will find a way to make it happen. Absolutely, uh, The good priests at least will. Absolutely. And um, they will, and obviously discretion is important and all that. So make sure we keep that in mind. But the point is, is that we can find, if you know good priests, it will happen. Yeah. And so I don't, I've never met a good priest who won't go through, do anything to, to hear somebody's confession. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I think those are the type of things that we, we can really do to make this time, which is a true time of deprivation, a true time of suffering into a time where graces are really being poured out in a way that they haven't been potentially for a very long time. Yeah. And what's cool is the traditional confessionals have social distancing built into them <laughs> and a screen. It's these stupid, dumb, silly, what a reconciliation rooms. Right. What a joke. What a uh, joke. We, my whole family just went to confession earlier this week. And uh, so, and of course we have the traditional box with the screen, but they even put up in addition to that, it's the normal screen where you can barely see through, but they actually put up a, a cloth <clears throat> on both sides as well. Mm -hmm. You can still hear and everything and, and it's no problem. And uh, just to, to protect, but it's great because we're keeping our social distancing and mm -hmm. uh, yet we're receiving the, the, the grace of God and the forgiveness of sins. Yeah, yeah. It's it awesome. was great. My daughter, I just went to the story. My daughter just received her first confession two weeks ago. Wow. She's about to receive first communion here in a few weeks and not a few weeks. Obviously, that's going to happen. It's right. scheduled for early May. I'm hoping that happens. If it doesn't, we'll figure things out. But but so the other night I was saying we need to all go to confession. And I initially started saying, well, Madeline, you just went two weeks ago. And also my wife gave her a crush. She said, no, no, no. We all need to go. I said, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I, I was wrong to even think that Maddie didn't have to go because she went two weeks ago. No, every single one of us had to go. Fortunately, my, my daughters who were out of town, uh, they told me they went as well. So I was like, the Salmons family, we're all ready at least. <laughs> right. So, and so if you can't, and that just real quick, if you have not gone to confession since this all started, and you can get to confession, go to confession ASAP. If, you're, if your parish is still offering it, go immediately. If it's today, go today, because they might have to stop making it available normally. And so you want to go if you can. If you can't, we've already talked about perfect, right. per perfect act of contrition. Right. And if you can't, be not afraid. It's a bad situation for you. But Christ wants you to get to heaven. He desires all men to be saved. If you literally cannot get to confession, he is going to give you extra graces to make that perfect act of contrition. You have to believe that so, and you have to try and make the effort. Uh, do not despair. Definitely do not despair. Christ desires all men to be saved. That includes you. If you're alive, you're in the game. <laughs> Spiro Sparrow, right? I, I breathe, I hope. As long as you're breathing, you have hope. So, uh, yeah, there it is. There it is. I think we covered a lot of good, good topics. Uh, just to review, have a non-anxious leadership uh, over your family, over your friends, especially over your family. Uh, continue to lead people to Christ. Help them prepare for death because we'll all die. Prepare yourself for death with sacramentals. Know how to baptize. Know how to make a perfect act of contrition. Um, and one thing we didn't mention, Eric, that we should probably do is you, you can't bring, you know, your friend to mass or to meet your priest after mass. You can't do that right now in some, most places, but we do have, just like there's live streaming for masses. There are enormous and, and wonderful Orthodox online resources that you can point people to. Uh, so you know, instead of just binge watching Netflix, you know, you can get on a channel like Census Fidelium and listen to some <laughs> really great homilies. You can get good old books and old catechisms. Maybe this is a time when you say, okay, we're all going through the Baltimore Catechism. I think I'm going to do that, actually. That's a good idea. We're all going well, to go through the Baltimore yeah. Catechism again. Speaking of Baltimore Catechism, one thing I want to highly recommend right now, if you have some, if you want to learn more about the faith, but if you have somebody who's now interested in the faith and you are leading, a great resource, and maybe we could I could send you, find a link, but uh, Father James Jackson, FSSP, mm -hmm. a fraternity priest in Colorado, he did an art, a adult conversion class where he went through the entire Baltimore Catechism, and there are like now, I can't remember, like a hundred different audio 
where he just goes through it. Okay. And it's each one is says what question it is, and he talks about it. That would be something. In fact, that's what we did when we I'm, I'm uh, helping out the adult conversion class at my uh, parish. And when we had to shut down, we were in the Baltimore Catechism. So what we did is we sent them. I sent them a link. I said, OK, listen to these from Father Jackson and go through these questions. We were on the sacraments at the time when we had to shut down. So I said, OK, go through these different lessons. And so I, I recommend that highly. And if you just search on Father Jackson adult conversion classes, you'll find it. It's okay. it, it's, a, it's a website of a parish in Colorado, but he's a paternity yep. priest, solid and all that. Yeah, so that's, uh, it's uh, that's Our Lady of Mount Carmel in Denver, right? Okay, I, probably, yeah. yeah. Sounds yeah. right. He also wrote a book on uh, the Mass, uh, Nothing Superfluous, is that it? Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. yeah, good guy, I've met him, good guy. Um, and also I, you know, uh, put in a plug here, I also offer online courses. I got nine different certificates, nine different curriculum. We got uh, Catholic philosophy and Thomas Aquinas. We got theology, Catholic theology. We got Catholic apologetics. We have church fathers, medieval theology, reformation and modern. We have Christ in the Old Testament, Christ in the New Testament, and we're doing history of the Roman Rite and the Latin Mass. In fact, at, when I get off with you, Eric, I'm going to film probably eight videos on the Latin Mass. I think today we're doing awesome. uh, vestments and vesting prayers and the history of the Mass. So I'm going to be videoing all day. Uh, and you can join at newsaintthomas.com. In fact, because of the corona and all that, we put up a coupon code. I'm going to put it on the screen. So if you want to uh, if you want to join, take classes, use the coupon code LENT, L-E-N-T, and that'll give you first uh, your first month half off tuition. You can check it out. Um, and there's a 21 day guarantee. So if it's not for you, we'll just give you your money back. Uh, no risk. So, uh, yeah, I mean, take the time to catechize yourself. Be a leader. Um, Christ is the good shepherd. All the graces that we are going to need, he is going to provide. We just have to conform to them along the way. So um, I want to thank you, Eric Sammons, for being on. Everybody follow Eric on Twitter. I love Eric is one of the most artful tweeters out there. I love watching. He can be so possible? savage and so subtle at the same time. Uh, he, he, he's really good at it. It's like watching a, a really good fencer do battle. Uh, very subtle and very deadly. But you can follow him on Twitter at Eric R. Sammons. You can see it on the screen. It's up there right now. Um, his book, Old Evangelization, is a great book, especially as we talk about how the early church was successful in evangelizing entire nations, cultures, languages, and how we do the new evangelization now, and it we're kind of losing numbers and losing momentum. So uh, hold it up again, Eric, the book, Old Evangelization by Eric Sammons. Where else can people follow you, Eric? I think Twitter is probably the best place. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where I'm mostly active is there. Yeah. So I just recommend going there. And if I if there's anything else I have going on, I put it there. Cool. Very good. And then uh, if you haven't liked this video yet, make sure you hit that thumbs up and like it so YouTube knows. Please subscribe. Hit the bell and notification. I'll probably, <laughs> I'm locked down too, folks. So I'll probably be doing some random videos. Maybe at, when the kids go to bed, I'll hop on. Uh, I thought about maybe reading some some books and praying some rosaries. So if you want to be notified for those live random things, make sure you subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. And then if you're using a tablet or phone, turn YouTube notifications on. You have to do that. Otherwise, nothing works. And I saw YouTube told me recently that only 25% of you have actually turned on your notifications on your phone. Somehow YouTube knows that. They're spying on you. So only 25% of you have your notifications on. So that means most of you aren't getting any of these. So turn those on. And then if you want to um, listen just to the audio, you can do that on podcasts. Go to Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search my name, Taylor Marshall. You'll find those. And thanks to everyone who supports on Patreon. Why not just cancel Netflix and support a channel like this? Go to patreon.com forward slash DR Taylor Marshall. I'll send you some cool merchandising depend in books. I'll sign books, give you some free courses to take. Uh, go to patreon.com forward slash DR Taylor Marshall. All right. Well, let's close in prayer. We'll do the Ave Maria and the Gloria Patri. And of course, we'll offer the Ave Maria for everyone who's suffering 
uh, spiritually and physically in this corona situation. Did you hear, Eric, about the fraternity seminarians who got the corona? I saw that right before I got on. Yeah. So a seminarian went to Italy. He brought the virus back to the seminary. And now half the priest professors and many, no, most of the priest professors and half the seminarians now have it. And they're under quarantine at seminary. And I think those, we can really know that those men are going to offer that up for, for sure. our salvation and for those who are sick. And that's a beautiful thing that I, I know, I understand the desire to protect our priests, but to be honest, they're the best ones. They're the ones who are supposed to be on the front lines. Yeah, they're and the so, SEALs. They're the Navy SEALs. That's right. And so when they get it and they offer, a, a good priest gets it and offers it up, I think that can be very powerful and can can bring about miracles, and can slow, including slowing the virus. All those things yes. can happen. Yep. So we'll, we'll, we'll pray. We'll include them in our prayer as well. So let us pray. Oremus. In nomine Patris et Fidii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater noster, qui es in celi, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra, panem nostrum quotidianum de nobis odie, dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris, et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos amalo. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in molieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, or per nobis peccatoribus, nunc et or mortis nostre. Amen. Gloria Patri, et Filio, et Spiritui Sancto, sicut erat in principio, et nunc et semper, et in secula seculorum. Amen. In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritui Sancti. Amen. St. Joseph, pray for us pray all for us. saints. Pray for pray us. Pray for us. All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure you're praying that rosary every day. We didn't mention it because we already know. If you're not praying the rosary, you're not on the team. Pray the rosary every day. That's the Bible on beads, and you'll get to know Jesus through Our Lady. Thanks for watching. Eric Samus, thanks for being with us. Everybody, Godspeed. Be safe. Be holy.